Back in 2012, on the campus of Alabama a and University, I had a friend of mine from New Jersey. He hit me up on the phone. He said, man, I think one of the most exclusive sneakers is coming out. And also they're dope at the same time. So I said, let me check out the design. Let me check out the label. But I said, Patrick Ewing? I didn't understand it. It was at that moment I realized it wasn't Nike. They weren't Adidas. They weren't Reebok. It was Patrick Ewing's signature shoe line. My mother was the only one that knew about it because she was brought up in that time. But I realized there was excitement that was brought inside of me that nobody knew on campus that I was going to have one of the most exclusive sneakers that wasn't Nike, wasn't Adidas, wasn't Reebok. But it brings me to today. Patrick Ewing's are the only sneakers that I've purchased since 2012. And also on today, I'm joined with a gentleman who's a purveyor of sneaker culture and business, who has been responsible for the relaunch of the Ewing Athletics brand, who also is a sneaker collector, who was a sneaker collector and is still today. And he grew up in the golden era of hip hop and sports, the 1990s and 1980s, of course. Mr. David Goldberg, CEO of GPF Footwear LLC, who's responsible for the relaunch and the marketing and distributing of the marquee brand, Ewing Athletics. How you doing today, Mr. David? How are you? I'm doing just fine. I'm doing just fine. Yeah, so I just uh, thank you. Thank you for taking out no the time problem. today thanks, or whatever. Thanks for coming by. Um, so I want to know a little bit about uh, when were you first introduced to uh, sneakers? Um, I'd say maybe six or seven. I grew up in, uh, in New York, uh, between Queens and Long Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a big Knicks fan. My dad used to take me to the games when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, I still remember when the first Jordans came out. And uh, I got my first, I started getting the good sneakers maybe by the time I could convince my mom to get me some. Maybe I was eight or nine years old. Oh, man. And, uh, you know, the Ewings, I, I remember seeing a kid at school with them. And uh, I had my first pair, I think, in 1990. I had the black 33 highs mm -hmm. when I was nine years old in 1990. Size five, I still remember them. And, uh, you know, it was one of my favorite brands growing up. I was a big Nick fan. Uh, Patrick was my favorite player. And um, l like you said, there was something different about it because it didn't say Nike or Adidas on it or whatever. It just had his name. There was no other company name, just his name. Mm -hmm. And. Um, you know, a lot of celebrities were wearing them. Uh, a lot of rappers wore them, so they had kind of that uh, that buzz to them. That, that stamp, the game yeah. that stamp. Do you remember your uh, first pair of sneakers? Um, I think my first pair of good ones was maybe some Reeboks in '87 or '88. And uh, my first real good pair, I had the Jordan Fives, yeah. black Jordan Fives. And then after that, I got uh, the Thirty Three Highs. Yeah. So could you um, could you tell me? Because mm -hmm. I was born in 1991. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you explain to me or kind of elab like elaborate on how like how was it growing up in like the 1980s 1990s with you know all the pre premier players around that time? Well, you know, I grew up you know like like you saying a huge fan of uh, hip hop music growing up in that era and and in New York when all that was happening and uh, the sneakers and the basketball but nobody knew like oh this is the golden era. Twenty years later, we'll be talking about the music, talking about the shoes, talking about the players. It was just. You know, that's what every day was, you know. Yeah. It, it's not like now. Nobody was saying, oh, the shoes from, or the music from the 1960s or 70s is so great. Let's talk about that then. So the nobody, nobody thought 20, 30 years later we would be talking about what was going on then. That was just kind of the everyday thing. Yeah. How did uh, Patrick Ewing, back at that time, like how did he impact the culture of New York and the culture of sports? Um, I mean, it had a big impact uh, because, you know, his first deal when he first came to the Knicks in 85, he was with Adidas and um, he was hurt his first few years. I don't think the shoes sold as well as Adidas wanted, so they kind of parted ways. And um, him and his agent, David Falk, who was also Michael Jordan's agent, mm -hmm. uh, they came, you know, they met with some other people in the industry and they came up with the idea, forget signing, you know, to another company, let's make your own brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really unheard of at the time. And, um, you know, like I said, it just took off very organically. It's not like now where, uh, you know, there's social media campaigns and all mm -hmm. this. There, there was no advertising for it. It just came out. It came out in more of the independent shops in, in New York City. When it first came out, it was only based in New York and the East Coast. 
and then it kind of spread organically to the rest of the country and then pretty soon to the rest of the world. Was it for you, was it, because you know a lot of a lot of people have like those sneakers and um, even in the time that we live in now, like a lot of people, you know, not to say like LeBron James doesn't have good, you know, pair of, like good looking like mm -hmm. in the designs mm -hmm. as far as like the sneakers, but a lot of people just love LeBron and like mm -hmm. what we like to call the stands, like yeah. where they just can't do yeah. it wrong. But for when Patrick Ewing released his shoe, was it the love for the for for Patrick Ewing the reason why you bought it, or was it just the design itself? Was I just think so I, I, originally I was a huge I was a huge huge fan of him, and uh, but it was also the design of the shoe. Even today, uh, especially the thirty three high, which is our signature shoe, kind of the flagship of the company. There's just something about it. It's kind of like a timeless classic design. Uh, you know, even guys younger than you, you know, thirteen fourteen year old kids mm -hmm. pick it up and buy it and. They don't really know the history of it. To them, it's just a good-looking shoe. Yeah. So I think it's hard to really quantify what uh, what gave the brand the success and uh, the impact that it did. It, it was him. It was the time and location being in New York in that golden era, and it was also the actual product, the design itself. Mm -hmm. I think they still, all played a part. Are you still a Knicks fan to this day? No, I'm not. Oh, I'm, yes. a, I'm a Nets fan now. A Nets fan. Yeah. Yeah. You're a Nets fan. Well, that would make sense because you say you grew up in the Long, yeah. Long Island. Because but but actually, I moved to Jersey in uh, yeah. in the early two thousands. So when the Nets were in New Jersey, that's when I became. Nets were also in Long Island. Yeah, originally. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So was, but now at this point, um, but even even with um, back about like the Ewing going mm -hmm. back to like the Ewing like the culture of the Ewing brand itself, mm -hmm. there was also a little concept that they that they uh, that him and David Falk came together with that David Falk more specifically mm -hmm. did before they actually came out with that that concept the uh, where they actually um, he didn't have he had an unbranded shoe it's like right. an all white type of shoe or well, whatever. it was actually the Adidas shoe what they did was uh, the shoes he was wearing with Adidas they went to the factory and he was so used to wearing them he was comfortable wearing that shoe to yeah. play in and uh, so they just made that shoe over well, with no logos no Adidas three stripes it was the same exact shoe but just all white and it's it's very, I have a few pictures of it. I haven't been able to locate a pair, but it's uh, very strange to see it because it, it's that Adidas conductor with no stripes, no logos, mm -hmm. no anything. And that's yeah, kinda, he wore that for almost a year. Yeah, and it was kind of like I, I looked into it and I read like David Fogg. It was like they they kind of piggy banked off the idea of what is Patrick wearing, and they yeah. kind of like build up the hype. And yeah. so when the brand came out, it was just like yeah. yeah. But you know, back then it was different too because now. You know, a guy signs a sneaker contract, everyone on Twitter and Instagram is talking about it and the sneaker blogs, there was no, you didn't know what deal, you know, all you saw was what he wore mm. and, you know, then eventually you saw it. There was a lot of mystery behind it. Mm. That was one of the things about it. There was no, you know, it was very mysterious when it came out because everyone was used to him wearing Adidas and then all of a sudden a year or two later, there's this shoe on the shelf all over New York City that just says Ewing. You know, it, it was just, it just kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, so between uh, 1990 and it was 1990, 1996, mm -hmm. you know, the company did so good. You know, mm -hmm. why did the company, what were some of the things that the company was doing that made it a hundred million dollar company? Well, they, uh, they became very big internationally. They had huge markets in Europe and in Asia and in South Africa, which is something where, uh, you know, we're trying to expand to those regions again. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, sneakers were really just, uh, the industry was really exploding at the time. And uh, Patrick obviously was probably one of the five best players in the game at the time. So, you know, as he got more popular, he was also on the Dream Team in 92. That really, that's what really catapulted the international business because they were so, uh, that was so groundbreaking, that team. And they were so visible across the world that after 92, the Ewing business really took off in the rest of the world because that was really the platform for people to learn about him and then all of a sudden, oh, here's these shoes, we'll go buy them, you know. Was was the love that you had for uh, Ewing, um, did you have just a love for how he played the game, but also did you respect also um, the business, like the entrepreneurship? To have his own, you know, signature Well, at the time, at the time, you know, when I was, you know, nine or ten, I wasn't thinking about the business of it, uh -huh. it was just... You know, he's my favorite player, the Knicks are my favorite team, and he has some cool shoes, you know what I mean? And I, and I want to wear those shoes. So I bugged my mom, you know, for months to get me a pair. We couldn't find them, and then finally we got them at uh, Green Acres Mall. Mm. I remember at Foot Locker. Yeah. So now, so now fast forwarding, 
you just told your age a little bit. Nine, ten. He was like nine, ten years old. Getting, yeah. Getting a pair of shoes. So you're growing, and now you know you're trying to build a career, trying to build a name for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, before you even established the company that we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, GPF. Um, what were you doing? What were you doing before you created the company? Uh, I was in. I went to college at Rutgers University, and uh, I was working in the hotel business. Uh, like general manager of hotels and stuff like that, so it's a much different uh, career than, than what person. I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to wear a suit every day and deal with a lot of people. So now, as you see, you know I, I wear a t-shirt and shorts. You know, it's uh, much different. I mean, were you still? Were you still at that point in time? You know, because you're having to, your lifestyle. A lot of people don't believe like when your when your career. Uh, when you make certain career changes, like what you wear on a daily basis kind of affects like your day to day, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then you kind of forget about what you were doing before then. Mm -hmm. uh, were you still at that point still uh, had a love for sneaker culture? Oh, definitely. I've been collecting shoes uh, ever since I was eight or nine. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was 15, I started working at a sneaker store and, uh, you know, I was working in the back, uh, opening the boxes, stocking the shelves and all that. And uh, eventually I started helping the customers and you know, I'd be wearing Air Force Ones or I'd be wearing some some old vintage Jordans. You know, this was like 1997 when eBay first came out and I was buying the older Jordans then. You could buy them for 20, 30 bucks. They weren't worth anything at the time. Wow. And people were always asking and the, the guy who owned the store, he finally said, Dave, all these people are asking for the shoes you have. <laughs> you know, why don't you start, you can start ordering the shoes. So I was going through the Nike catalogs and Reebok catalogs and I would actually order pick out the shoes that the store should carry mm -hmm. and uh, you know when I was like 16 so I've always kind of been into uh, the sneaker business and then uh, I started saving some money I remember I, I bought some stock in Nike and in Reebok even way back then mm -hmm. you know I sold it to make a little money I wish I had kept it at that price at 16 you yeah. were buying stock yeah because I said you know this is this is it you know Nike, Nike is going to be huge and uh, I've always been very into uh, the culture and the business of it. Were your parents like buying stock as well, or? Uh, I think I think I think, I think my dad might have bought some too. Okay. But uh, you know, I think we sold it maybe a year or two later. We made some. You know, it had went up a lot. We said, "Oh, we'll make make the money." Mm -hmm. uh, you know, had we had you kept it at that 1996 or 1997 price today, I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds. Probably wouldn't. Probably wouldn't even yeah. sitting here talking yeah. to you right now. Like, yeah. It would probably be somewhere in a high rise somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. So, did any of your parents, um, like, did any of your parents have their own business? Um, yeah, we were in the real estate and hotel business a little bit. Okay. So they kind of uh, instilled that in me as far as uh, yeah. yeah, owning your own business and kind of being your own boss. But a lot of people, a lot of my friends and stuff when I was in school thought I was crazy because I was so into the shoes. And back then, it wasn't as accepted as now. Now it's you know, you're a sneakerhead. It's cool to collect a bunch of shoes. Back then, people were like Dave, why do you have all these shoes? Why are you, you know, I would read the East Bay catalogs, bring them to school and yes. look at them. Why are you so into it? You know, it's just yeah. shoes. Who cares? My parents used to say, you know, who cares about all this? It's just a pair of shoes. You know what I mean? But to me, it was, you know, much more than that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, fast forward 10, 20 years, you know, now everyone's into it. Now, now 10, 20 years yeah. from now, now you have your, your company, GPF yeah. uh, Footwear, LLC. Yeah. So what made you get into, because a lot of people open stores they mm -hmm. open you know uh, boutiques where they provide mm -hmm. apparel um th those are the normal routes and you know how people go about if they you know if they love sneakers they love the urban the mm -hmm. urban uh, culture within itself what made you uh, start a licensing company um some people had a approached me uh two people who i'm close with elon friedman and uh, mike packer of uh, packer shoes mm -hmm. they had uh I met them through some mutual friends and uh, they had a relationship with David Falk where they had been talking about trying to bring it back and they were looking for uh, another person to come on board to help and um, like I said I had been working at hotels and stuff and in that business and you know they they had randomly texted me about it or oh, would you be interested and I, I still remember replying oh a hundred percent I'm interested mm -hmm. and uh, kind of never looked back from there I, qu I quit uh, quit my job got into this and just you know just ran here we are that yeah. was about about six years ago oh man so what's the primary functions of a, a licensing company well you know uh 
we licensed the name and image of Patrick from directly from Patrick himself, and uh, Patrick is very involved. I have a great relationship with him. He uh, he lives not too far from here when uh, when he's in town, and uh, he comes by all the time. He knows all the you know whatever we're working on. It all goes through him for his uh, approval, and. Um, You know, it's like, you know, he, Patrick is really, like, it's not something, like, Patrick is a true partner in the brand, you know what I mean? And he's fully involved, and uh, that's just the way that the structure is set up as a license deal, but he's, you know, fully involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, Something a little different than uh, most sneaker companies, because, you know, our company is GPF, but we don't market, market, right, the the name, the name is Patrick Ewing, that's, that's what we market. So when a company, so could you break down to me, you know, when a company buys a license mm-hmm. to, uh, as your company mm-hmm. is, your partner, your partner company. Well, it's more for like a time period. You don't buy it outright. So it's mm-hmm. more if you have it for a period of time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Patrick owns everything, Patrick Ewing. So what are the, um, what would you say is like some of the benefits of like actually having a license company? Well, because, uh, you know, if I tried to make my own sneaker company called GPF or whatever I want to call it, who would care about that? You know what I mean? Gotcha. But, you know, to be able to partner with Patrick and David Falk, who really did the deal with him directly uh, before I got to know Patrick well, uh, you know, his name is, you know, one of the most famous names of all time. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, we got the rights to uh, all the original shoes and everything as well, so. Uh, so it was said that at that, um, at that moment in time, like because there was a, a lot of people were asking like mm-hmm. Patrick Ewan to like, hey, mm-hmm. I want you to bring, I want you to bring back the actual mm-hmm. company. Like mm-hmm. I want the Ewan brand. Mm-hmm. And he was just kind of like skeptical and also David Falk. Yeah. But I read where it took David Falk like I mean, over they well over like thought it out for like over five years, a hundred meetings. But yeah, it was something that they saw about within your company, GPL Footwear, that made them embody so much trust. And what was what was that? Um, what was that like? Um, well, things had ended very badly with the uh, the original company in the '90s, and the people who were Patrick's partners at the time. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get into it, but it it, yeah. it ended very badly. Patrick and David Falk were not happy with it, and I think they were, uh, because of what happened, they were very skeptical of new people because they had a bad taste in their mouth from what happened. And um, But, you know, during that time, as we just discussed, sneakers and everything got bigger and bigger. The interest in the old stuff and that ni- 90s era kind of grew with time. And, um, you know, I had a bunch of meetings with David Falk and Patrick and... Uh, I remember I met with them at the Four Seasons Hotel on 57th Street, which is like a real fancy hotel. We met at the restaurant there, mm-hmm. and um, everyone's wearing suits and everything. And I come in with, I came in with a duffel bag, a vintage Ewing duffel bag from the 90s, full of old original 90 shoes in this fancy restaurant. Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> I pull out all the shoes on the table. The shoes are breaking apart because they're so old, they're crumbling. Uh-huh. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to show them that I'm not some guy just saying, hey, we can make a quick buck off this and uh, you know that this was something that was extremely important to me part of my childhood and uh, something I'm very passionate about and I, w- I wanted to show them that as opposed to just talking about number we barely even discuss numbers I just wanted to show them Passion. you know look look how much I care about this I'm the, I, even at the time then even before any of this happened I was already collecting the vintage Ewing shoes just to have them because I was still interested and without even knowing it would ever come back so uh, I think once they saw that and uh, we started talking to them about the numbers and stuff, Patrick kind of gave the go-ahead, like, hey, you know, I, I trust them, you know, that, you know, he has good intentions, you know what I mean? So I think Don't that was bad. it. And, uh, you know, the original plan was uh, no one ever thought of, you know, we signed the deal with them in 2011. The shoes came out, like you said, in 2012, I think about August or September of 2012, mm-hmm. late summer. And here we are, you know, it's almost that time in 2016. No one ever thought it was going to still be here. This was kind of something they thought, look, if you can get a couple of years out of it, that would be great. Nobody knew what would, uh, what would, change would happen. Yeah. 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 So I'm pretty sure you did a lot of history on, you know, because you were around when the company first started uh, collecting the shoes and everything else like that. And so, of course, you, you went into actually 
going into this opportunity wanting to have the license for Ewing Athletics mm -hmm. um, and looking at what were some of this, I'm pretty sure you looked at some of the mistakes that the company, the, the company that had it before, yeah. how did you take what uh, the company uh, did not do in the past to maintain the, uh, maintain the brand that you guys are doing with the company now? Well, one of the main things that they did where uh, it proved to be a mistake, you know, at the they they tried to get too big too fast and uh, they were making all type they were making a huge incredible volume of shoes um, I mean they were making running shoes they were making hiking boots they were making so many times types of things and um, you know the intentions were good obviously as businessmen they wanted to grow the business I think what happened was that the business just got too big and um, like I said some things happened where uh, you know, some things happened. They just there was just too much inventory, and uh, too many models. I mean, it was. You know, we make about we release about one to two, three at the most colors a month. We don't make a huge quantity. We like to keep it limited. You know, they they're kind of in and out. They were making. I mean, it's like twenty models. Like yeah, say like twenty models. Yeah, before there, the end. Yeah. yeah, there had to have been at least twenty models. I mean, I have I have almost all of them, but there had to have been at least twenty models. Each shoe had like ten to twelve colors. There was just so many uh, models and colors, and um, I think they got yeah. They said the focus of the brand became, it had moved on past what people originally liked. You know, people mm -hmm. didn't want to buy Ewings to have running shoes and hiking boots and all this other stuff. They had kind of gotten away. From that, and also during that time, the the sneaker, the the product changed so much. If you look from 1990 to 1996, if you look at what Nike was doing, if you look at you know the Nike from 1990, and then you look at the technology Nike had by 1996, it had cool. evolved yeah. not just once or twice, but numerous. It was evolving every year, and the original Ewing, they were kind of still stuck in that early 90s, no technology, basic bulky shoe, which is still what we do today because you know we want to capture that essence but at the time the industry and people's tastes had timing, gotten more futuristic yeah. and modern yeah the timing yeah the timing is everything you have to evolve as they say you got to yeah. evolve with the time and uh people had just kind of moved on they weren't they didn't you know there was no retro then people didn't want to wear a bulky heavy shoe because nike and adidas and reebok you know they had the pump they had air they had all hirachi you know all these new technologies and lighter weight and more sleeker designs with you know better materials and stuff everything Changed so quickly, yeah. and uh, they kind of didn't catch up. Said so you, it, I seen where uh, Patrick Union had did an interview. And he said what really also harmed the company was because a lot of kids were trading in like the Union sneakers. They were trading in their sneakers for Timberlands and yeah. Nike, like yeah. you, you were just talking yeah. about. Yeah, Timberland Nike. and yeah. Doc Martens became a uh, huge like in the mid nineties. Yeah, there were, there was a period in the mid '90s where even Nike cooled down a lot on their signature shoes for 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 a few years. But you know that's how the the footwear business is. It's always in cycles. Right now, um, you know, running shoes and casual running shoes are the big trend in footwear right now. Because everything's so casual. Right, you know? everything yeah. is casual. And uh, but you know, three four years ago, uh, performance basketball was on fire. So it's uh, the footwear industry is always cyclical. It's always up and down and and in cycles. So you just have to kind of. Uh, be prepared for that and, and be able to weather that. Yeah. And at the time, the original company, they weren't able to uh, to weather that change. Yeah, and there's also outside of like looking at what affects the account, like the um, the revenue of the company. Mm -hmm. There's but one thing that sets you in apart is it is its history. Right. Um, how are you how are you now like educating like the the history of like you and to the kids that? Well, we have our website ewingathletics.com. We have kind of a timeline with all the sh all the past models on there, a uh, little, you know, a little blurb on each one about the history of it, what year it came out, you know, did he wear it on court, um, you know, on our Instagram, we're always showing the old models, and that's really kind of how we get the feedback of the people to determine what we're going to bring back, is, you know, we'll show the old models on Instagram, and if, you know, people kind of cast their votes, say, hey, bring that one back, you know, we'll, we'll do it. What do you, um, what are some of the uh, rules and regulations of running a sneaker company? Like, what are some of the, you got to have, like, you have to have this in order for you to... Um, I mean, there's no specific, I mean, what do you, what do you mean? So, uh, is there, so, in order for you to, you know, have, like, a, uh, 
in order for you to have a successful, like mm-hmm. run a successful sneaker mm-hmm. company, uh, do you have to have certain partnerships? What type of partnerships? Oh uh, yeah, you have, you have to have great uh, great relationships with uh, with your stores, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in a lot of uh, chain stores now, like uh, DTLR and Jimmy Jazz, Foot Action. So uh, having those relationships between your sales team and the buyers for the stores is really essential. Um, in the beginning, if you remember, we were in more of like the, the boutique kind of stores, like Packer Shoes and stuff like that. And um, you know, we had uh, we had great relationships with those guys as well. So I'd say uh, really networking and having good relationships, because really your customers, the stores, they're not just customers. Really, they have to be your partners. You know, you have to really. Uh, Work with them for for things to go well. I heard that you're you. I heard that you're you're also involved within the design process of the sneakers itself. Yeah. Um. How do you how do you keep yourself you know because because you guys have released so many different colorways of like some of the models. How do you like keep yourself inspired? You know. Uh, do you travel? I mean, what is um, it that inspires you? It, it's hard. I, I never meant to be uh, the designer, but um. Originally, we were only bringing back the original colorways, and what happened was the first four colorways we made sold so well that it was like, okay, we got to catch up now and uh, start designing more. So I just, uh, I was paying a guy to do it, and um, it would never come out how I wanted him to do it. I'd say, oh, make it like this, and he'd never get it right, and I'd have to go back with him four or five times to get what was in my head to come out on the computer. And I finally said, you know what, I'm wasting so much time it took me a week or two just to get this final image on one. I said, I just have to learn how to uh, use use Photoshop and Illustrator myself. So I just went on YouTube and taught myself how to do it. And uh, we have some other people who still design some stuff and, and give us ideas and inspiration. But for the most part, I, I do most of it, uh, most of it on my own. Mm. But like you said, it's hard to, uh, after you do so many, it's hard to, okay. uh, yeah. You got to continue to yeah. uh, be inspired because yeah. we see it all the time, you know, see a lot of designers, see a lot of brands that crash and a lot of times it's because they don't, they don't give themselves times and allow the vision to bloom, but you have to, you have to allow yourself, you have to understand that you are a part of the vision that you're creating for other people to, you know, recognize. You have to, you know, you have to take care of yourself personally. It has to be a balance. Uh, what do you believe some of the... What do you believe, um, what are some of the mistakes uh, that you've made within business that you have learned from that has, um, that has gave you so, so much success on today? Um, as far as design, uh, I had to learn not to design for what I like and what I think is cool because what, you know, what I like, that, that the customer may not like it. So I really have to design for what our customer is going to like. And I made that mistake a few times. Because I'd say, oh, I like this, but, you know, maybe the stores won't like it. Maybe the 16-year-old kid out there won't like it. So that was really something that I had to learn. Um, you know, there's always going to be mistakes in business. Like you said, you, you have to learn from it and, uh, you know, just make sure that it doesn't happen again. You know, if it happens, sometimes it's good for a mistake to happen because you can catch it and learn from it then before it happens on a bigger scale, you know, maybe a year or two later. So... That's just part of the business and growing and uh, evolving. What are some of the, how do you keep your, um, because a lot of people, a lot of reasons, a lot of people don't know that, um, and I've seen it firsthand, uh, coming from uh, like around a group of like entrepreneurs and stuff like that from back home, and a lot of them, uh, they can't balance their business because of their personal, their personal lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So how do you, um, how do you keep your personal lifestyle uh, to where your business and those don't intertwine to where one has to uh, take a fall? Um, you know, that's a good question. It's, it's very hard because, uh, you know, maybe my wife could give you a better better <laughs> answer than me. But, uh, you know, it, it's very hard. Running a business takes a lot out of you. It does take a lot out of your personal life. And, uh, you know, I'm always on the phone or I'm always on the computer all times at night, uh, you know, doing something. And, uh, that's, you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur and kind of run a business, that's just part of the uh, the sacrifice. But, you know, having that balance it is very important. It's something I've gotten better at as time has went on. There's certain times I'll just turn my phone off or just say, you know, I'm going to spend tonight with just the kids. I'm not going to, you know, be looking at my phone and stuff like that because it's not, it's not fair to them. But it's a, it's a good question. It, it, you do need that balance. Yeah. 
Well, also at the same time you spoke about your wife, you said that that helps you, but it's also it's another person a part of your team, Jason Nelson, who's the director of mm -hmm. marketing that we're gonna spend some time with as well, mm -hmm. who is a part of the backbone. Hundred percent. Uh, yeah, yeah. Jason kind of makes the whole uh, back end of everything go, as far as everything from uh, marketing and advertising to uh, shipping and distribution. So uh, with, without him, the company doesn't run. Yeah. So I want to uh, just encourage. Encourage you and you know, um, and also the UN, UN athletics team uh, continue to bring out exclusive things because you know uh, when they came out, I was just like, those are the those are the shoes that I'm going to get or whatever like that because I know there's none other like nobody else would like them now. And now you know, like I think I was talking to Jason. Jason was saying that now the South is is really yeah like one yeah of the southeast guys. southeast uh, Baltimore DC area that DMV area. Really along I-95 going straight down to Florida. Um, it's just caught on really big down there mm. for, you know, whatever reason. Yeah. Well, I thank you for taking out your time thank you. today. Thanks for coming by. Uh, here with David Goldberg, CEO of GPF Footwear LLC, uh, licensed company for Ewing Athletics. Thank you again, Mr. Thank Lee. you. Thanks for coming. Pleasure.